depend, though. I mean, if I think about it from my own more medical point of view, right? I mean, exposure to certain sorts of bacteria and virus when you're young are pretty good things. Mm -hmm. They create a kind of physical resilience, right, and protection. Mm -hmm. um, but certain kinds of exposures kill you, and if you're dead, like that's not a good thing, right? right? So, 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 and the word disease itself, you know, generally means. It can mean almost anything, but strictly speaking, from mm -hmm. a medical point of view, we mean something for which we know the underlying um, pathophysiology and etiology as opposed to, say, syndromes where psychiatrists spend, they're looking at signs and symptoms because although they can treat underlying causes, they're not sure what the mechanisms are. So, um, so from that point of view, um, you can understand where having no exposure to illness can create a much greater crisis later on when the exposure takes place. For instance, Epstein-Barr, if you never have Epstein-Barr until you're an adolescent, then you're going to have a much worse outcome, or if you don't have it until you're 40, mm -hmm. right? Same is true, say, a zoster or chickenpox or something like that. So, um, can we make the same kind of analogy with mental illnesses, with these syndromes, that, that there's a better time to have exposure? So, maybe Gandhi and... Um, um, and others who, who uh, are king, in a sense, yeah. right, who had a severe childhood, fairly young, um, mental disorder, could that have protected them instead of necessarily being seen as something that we attach to them forever? I think these are the kinds of questions that we need to be asking. And, and it's also just like in physical illnesses, not all physical illnesses have benefits. Many don't, many have almost no benefits, some do. Same thing with mental illnesses. I'm focusing on mania and depression. That doesn't apply to schizophrenia or other things. So, so the title of your book, using the word madness, which I understand from a marketing point of view, mm -hmm. but, but normally when people use the term madness, especially lately and, and historically, they're often talking about much more severe mental disorders, right. like schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um, bipolar disorder, of course, is a serious illness. Mm -hmm. right? But... Um, so I wonder if, if there's a way for us to, are we sort of getting back to, you know, we have this category now, major depressive disorder, which mm -hmm. is a grab bag mm -hmm. of a variety of depressive disorders. I wonder if we're, if by lumping these things together for one purpose, that we're not really missing the nuance. In other words, there might be, and we call them the same thing, mm -hmm. but we're not, we don't know they're the same thing. All we know is, and maybe in some of these disorders, we don't really know if all schizophrenia are the same thing, no, it's not right? Same. So it's pretty helpful to know which ones you want to be exposed to early, yeah. and which ones you wouldn't. Right. Mm -hmm. I think in the popular mind, madness can connote psychosis, which means delusion, hallucin delusions, or hallucinations. Right. And we're not focusing on that. It's not what I'm talking about here. Um, on the other it hand, is your title. well, on the other hand, manic depression it can up to fifty percent of patients will have brief psychotic symptoms during during their lifetime. So it's consistent with that, it's just that they're not chronically psychotic all the time, like schizophrenics are. So you have to know the nuances of it. You know, there's an article a few years ago by some psychiatrists called, What is the Heartland of Psychiatry? And the heartland of psychiatry, historically, has been schizophrenia. That's what people have focused on over the last hundred years. Um, to some extent, depression recently. But you could make the argument that it should be manic depression or bipolar disorder, because it's very common. It happens in 1 to 2% of the population, at least maybe up to 5% if you define it broadly. Severe depression happens in 5 to 10% of the population. All that is, you know, about 5 to 10 times more than schizophrenia, so it's much, much more common. And when you go back and look at how the term madness has been used over centuries, usually writers are referring to, to melancholia, severe depression, or mania. They're not describing the chronic psychosis that we call schizophrenia. So I think it's a legitimate use of the term, both historically and scientifically. I don't remember you saying that in the book. Nobody asked me that in the book. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, you're right. I didn't say that ahead of time. But yeah. So, um, so um, what about resilience? I mean, you write about resilience, mm -hmm. and it's a very interesting thing. I, we, we look at, um, in my course, I think we've been looking at bipolar, I'm sorry, at post-traumatic stress disorder. And one of the things, that the more you look at it, the more it becomes clear that sometimes you make the diagnosis so prematurely that anyone who's gone through a serious, um, stressful event, which 
you know, it's very possible people go through stressful events and then find ways to deal with them mm -hmm. without necessarily be, being given a diagnosis. In fact, they'd be a little weird if you went through the stress that some people go through more and you had no out, no negative results, right? And then there's the argument also that in the new DSM that we're going to change the time at which we consider it in terms of severe loss of some of the family that we consider treatment. So is, do you think, where, where do you stand on this? Do you think we're moving too quickly toward making diagnoses too quickly or, or do you think it's sort of in the right place and should the new DSM-5? Um, um, I'm not sure where I stand on that. I don't think I have a general stance on it. Uh, on the specific grief uh, issue, um, I'm sympathetic to the changes in DSM-5. Um, I think the cutoffs are arbitrary and, and people are devising the cutoffs based on whether or not they want people to be treated, which I think is the wrong way to approach it to begin with. I think we should let the science guide us on it, and then clinicians should be educated about when it's appropriate to be treated or not. Those are two separate issues. But I mean, we both know that given the wide variety of talents in any profession, <laughs> that some people are just going to do it by the book. They're not going to be able to go in and say, and so the net result will be, always on, because it becomes a standard of practice, then you have to do it. Yeah. And so uh, the net result will be just... You know, I, I have to say I'm sympathetic with critics of DSM, yeah. but not for the usual, often the same reasons that they're critical of it. I think the idea that we have to have a book that enforces treatment on things like that is excessive. I think there should be more clinical freedom of judgment. Right. But it's very difficult in the litigatious world in which we live once it gets down on paper. Right. Well, what about post-traumatic stress disorder. Do you think we over-treat that or under-treat that? Or, because the I definition of what, what's considered post-traumatic stress yeah. used to be an event, and now it's a repressed memory for some people. Well, you know, as you know, Howard, the way I think about psychiatry, I think about two essentially different classes of patients or conditions that we're dealing with. One class is more biological, and I, and I sort of insist on using the word disease-based that would be schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and severe depression, which is what I'm writing about in the first wave madness. But the other group is everything else. A lot of PTSD patients, people with personality abnormalities, uh, a lot of anxiety conditions, uh, short-term stress-related problems. Those aren't probably you know, genetic biological diseases. In fact, we know they're not genetic very much, um, like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. They're much more environmental. And I think that uh, in I, I, in our culture today, we use drugs a lot for all of those classes. And, and if, in my view, if we're talking about the non-biological, less biological, less disease-oriented conditions, we should be using drugs a lot less. But in the biological disease-oriented conditions, in fact, we might not be using the drugs enough, or the right ones at least. Yeah, so I, I think in the PTSD case, in my view is, yeah, we're probably overusing a lot. Of the okay. Another problem, I guess, with PTSD is that there are probably some people that come with prior conditions that we don't, the military is supposed to, in fact, um, exclude people with bipolar disorder from service. They're supposed Are to. Are they? Yeah, so, mm -hmm. but they're never, the way they do it depends upon the market conditions. Well, we did one study where we found that people with bipolar disorder had less PTSD than people who don't have bipolar disorder. Yeah, well, no, I meant just in general, they keep bipolar people up because of the high suicide rate. Oh, okay. Yeah, military, yeah. Right. But, but then PTSD, there may also be another kind of life history that we just don't, that makes some people more vulnerable and others. No, but the interesting thing, I guess, about the pharmacology of psychiatry is that we spend a lot of time carefully making a diagnosis to separate out different disorders that we think from their signs and symptoms are quite different from one another. And then we move from one drug to the other, pretty much often use some of the exact same drugs for the same, for very different conditions. So. Uh, What's going on here? Why? Well, I, I actually, I don't think we spend a lot of time carefully making diagnoses. Doctors tend to take a symptom-oriented approach. They treat symptoms with drugs. That's what psychiatrists routinely do these days, as opposed to carefully getting at diagnoses and figuring out which ones need which drugs and which ones don't need drugs, hardly at all. The drugs themselves, though, it is odd that we call things atypicals, assuming that the typicals are working on a hypothesis that we no longer accept, right? which is the amine hypothesis. That somehow rather that the reason you're depressed is you don't have enough serotonin. Even if increasing the transmission of serotonin might treat the depression, that doesn't necessarily. It's all, you know, in my view, I think that's very speculative. Even though it's biology, it sounds like science, it's very speculative.
So where are we with those sorts of things? I mean, how do we understand, how do you understand the mechanism, say, of depression? What, what do you think well, is going on? Depression is not a disease. You know, okay. So it, it depends on what, as you said, major depressive disorder is a very broad and heterogeneous right. category. And so when part of that category, people who have very severe, episodic, melancholic depression, uh, used to be called manic depressives. Right. And this, the biology of their depression is not really so much the biology of the depression, it's the biology of the cycling into and out of the episodes. Which we have, you know, there's at least some research that's suggesting that some things like uh, circadian rhythms may be relevant, the clock gene may be relevant, um, and it's the abnormality of the circadian rhythms that may be sending people into periods of underactivity and then overactivity sometimes.